Welcome to Balkans Debrief. I'm Ilva Tara, a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Europe Center. And today I'm honored to welcome Melinda Bregu, Secretary General of the Regional Cooperation Council, as she nears the end of her six-year mandate. Welcome, Melinda. Well, it's a pleasure for me to meet you here, Ilva. It has been quite a journey marked by challenges, uh, but also by resilient steps forward uh, for unity and progress across uh, our region, the Western Balkans. And I hope today we can take a moment to reflect on the most pressing issues uh, shaping our region, from the enduring bilateral disputes to the essential work of reconciliation among Balkan societies. You have often reminded uh, the audiences uh, that every cloud has a silver lining, and I'm eager to hear your thoughts on the region's desperation for progress and its European aspirations. Where does the political will, in your view, stand today in guiding the Balkan societies from the conflicts of the past towards a shared European future? Uh, let me just start by trying... Uh, okay, first, what you said on the resilience is like the key word that I am about to repeat during our interview. Uh, because if there is anything that uh, uh, sums up this experience of six years uh, of mine working with the Western Balkans, but uh, that of the region itself, uh, with that the feeling that that is really quite quite important and omnipotent uh, everywhere around is the resilience. So the resilience to build up, to deepen the, the cooperation, to enlarge the economic integration to run from a concept of cooperation and good neighborhood policies to that of building up a common regional market and then laying down or paving the way to the entrance to the single market. So all this asks for a lot of, uh, of courage, uh, let's say perseverance and, and, uh, and resilience. So these are quite, uh, quite important. Where does the region stand? Six years ago, I have to say, and now I can really make, make a difference on that regard. I have to say that uh, when I started this journey working with the Western Balkans, things were not that clear on the necessity to work stronger together or on the feeling of, uh, of togetherness or in like uh, just uh, trying to leave behind all those isolationist policies and uh, trying to highlight the benefits of the cooperation among each other. And I find that now after the six years, never this region has been as free and conscious on the importance of cooperation. Uh, that is spelled out from all from 82% of the citizens in the region. And I think you can notice that as well in all those uh, delightful speeches of the leaders whenever they meet each other. What do you see as the biggest concern facing the people of the Western Balkans today? It's not my opinion. We tend to measure the opinion of the citizens and that of the business community of the region every year through our instrument and survey that is the Boston Barometer. And I can say that the biggest concerns that the citizens are feeling and then uh, naming are the economic situation, so the raising of prices, inflation in the region. When it comes to uh, the biggest non-economic concerns, corruption is, uh, is one that is uh, quite, uh, quite present. And then uh, when it comes to the security, uh, let's say, concerns, and then uh, the citizens of the region have quite some clear ideas that could really hamper, let's say, if they feel secure or not secure among themselves. And some of those are related with, let's say, the high tones of disputes being present in the region, but they also have concerns, and this is like a topic that... Uh, uh, anybody should have to elaborate even even further. They have pretty much concerns on the depopulation of the region. And this is becoming uh, a high security uh, concern. So migration, people leaving from the region and then making this region looking, appearing and becoming smaller than before. You just said it, the question that I was thinking of, uh, because uh, we have the current EU membership uh, support in the region at the 54% level. And we had a decrease this time for the first five years. Uh, it started in uh, 2012 with a lower percentage that it increased uh, during 2021. And now we reached at the 54%. Uh, and which this is, is the lowest it has ever been. It is the lowest in the last five years, at least, which is the sign uh, of the frustration. And, uh, you know, when the level of expectations is quite high and those expectations are not met, 
within the time that the citizens are promised to, or they believe that those expectations should be met, then the frustration and disappointment goes high. But if I would like to comment it in a more positive sense, I would say that that percentage of stronger and higher, uh, let's say, uh, 82% of support in the regional cooperation as well, makes people believe that you should be keen to work closer with each other, with your neighbors first, because the journey to you is, is going to be a longer one. But then the necessity to work closer together, it's something that uh, it's your, your daily reality. Can this trend be rever reversed, the decreasing of the support? And who are the guilty parties for this uh, frustration that you mentioned? I don't tend to, to point any, any blame finger. It always takes two to tango, so uh, the problems are never uh, are never just, uh, they, they don't show only one to one face, they're always two-faced. Then the long, let's say, the stagnation of the European perspective of the Western Balkans for so many years, uh, it is one of, uh, one of the reasons. Uh, then let's say that kind of uh, being a bit stuck at home with the promises or uh, the level, let's say, of uh, reforms being met. Uh, at home as well as the level of frustration or increased level of frustration. So it's a combination of both factors. From one side, let's say this kind of, of sluggishness from the, uh, from the EU side to keep the process of European integration within, let's say, let's say the reality margins of, uh, realistic margins of time. But on the other side, the, the citizens as well, that they uh, hope so much, they hope that they would be member states years ago, and now their frustration is show, shown even by what I mentioned you earlier. Like, so they are yeah. voting on their feet, so they are leaving their countries. Uh, Melinda, under your leadership, uh, what would you consider RCC most significant achievement, particularly uh, with the common regional market? And uh, if you don't mind, can you explain it in easy words? What is this common regional market 2.0? So in... Uh, yeah, that's the, 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 the easy words are, are usually the hardest. So let me just take one, one uh, clear or try to elaborate that a bit. Uh, I said this region started years ago uh, with a good neighborhood policy. So after the war in former Yugoslavia, uh, the idea was to make the countries live in peace next to each other. Then it developed later into, let's say, economic cooperation among each other. Uh, years ago, in 2014, it started the idea with the Berlin process to have and build up or create a regional economic area. From that regional economic area, now the necessity moved in deepening the economic relations and the economic integration of the economies of the Western Balkan Six. Uh, altogether, we are a market of less than 18 million people. And in times where the only constant is uncertainty, uh, all the regions as well have a reason why they come together. Because you need to meet the challenges uh, locally, regionally, and then globally. And no one can really run or sing a solitary song on that, on that regard. So the common regional market, too, is the second phase of the common regional market. So we, we let's say, delineated it. Then it started to be implemented in some, uh, so some reforms and some deliverables started to take, uh, to take over. And now we are passing to the phase when we are preparing the region for the gradual entry into the EU single market. So that's how the whole, let's say, trajectory of the of the of the whole process has been has been uh, uh, designed. Made. And okay. then on you you asked on the on the achievements. Some things can be easily mentioned, like uh, the roaming free in the Western Balkans. Uh, in July 2021, so we know that all the, the uh, economies of the Western Balkan Six have a roam-free zone. And from that moment of 2021, we have 500% increase of roaming users within the Western Balkan Six. But a year ago, and we didn't stop in there, uh, it was uh, our initiative to move further in uh, reducing the prices uh, EU and the Western Balkans. And by starting the process of, of reductions of the roaming charges between Western Balkans and the EU, in a year, we had 95%, nearly 95% of increase in the consumption, consumption for all the Western Balkan six. So it's almost 100, which means that the citizens are paying less 
and less than they are used to when the, the roaming, uh, uh, let's say, reductions uh, uh, started a year ago, EU Western Balkans, because the rest it's, uh, among us is zero. Then I can mention the green lanes in the region. That is a story that is uh, often, it looks like it's, it's, it's not mentioned, mentioned uh, highly, but I should just remind that we started with, with the green lanes in the region, and actually it was RCC who initiated the idea. At one of the most difficult moments for the Western Balkans, and it was a difficult moment worldwide, which was the COVID pandemic. And we noticed that we were having problems at that, that time with all the, the foods and the trade of foods and the, all the moving of, of drugs and so on to our countries. And that is the, let's say, the pivotal moment when the Green Lane story started, building up the solidarity, keeping our borders open during the pandemic. Now that is extended with some of the EU uh, member states. This region has now in place a pool of seven professions officially recognized, at least indoors, because the implementation should start now that CETA is deblocked, which is the same pool of professions recognized in the EU. So it's another, let's say, step forward, moving from local to regional, then to the European, uh, let's say, perspective. Uh, and this is quite important. The region has a green agenda as well in place now, which is the same model of the green agenda of the EU, and it goes in line with all the climate change priorities. And there are a lot of benefits that we manage, although might look small, like involving for the first time and giving, giving let's say, uh, a taste of social economic perspective to the region that was usually prone to conflict. So we have more women uh, networks now in entrepreneurship. We identified and we ran the innovative agendas of trying to support the innovative ideas when it comes to IT, AI, or digital solutions from the people of this region. So there are some things that we can really be proud of. But, or however, after the coma, I have to say that all of us, the regional organizations, are responsible for bringing together or combining the proposals that come from, from the economies themselves. We are not responsible for the implementation of the agreements that have been set through or endorsed. And you have said this, uh, signing agreement is important, but implementation is key. Do you have any concrete example? What do you mean or who do you have in mind when you say that? But I just mentioned, for example, the recognition of professions and, uh, and uh, diplomas. So if we didn't have uh, the problems of the CEFTA being blocked, for example, then those agreements would have been in place. Or I, we have the problem with the freedom of movement with ID cards. The story was initiated by us years ago, the time Sarajevo was heading the or chairing the Southeast cooperation process, because we wanted to give an impetus and remove or tear down the wall of visas between Bosnia, Herzegovina and Kosovo. Because all these agendas of mobility that I started to mention will really be nulled if we don't have the freedom of movement among everyone in the region. But right now, it's, uh, it's not working in, uh, in all the six economies of the region. Because Bosnia-Herzegovina, as you know, has not agreed to uh, implement, uh, although that is endorsed and signed uh, two years ago as part of the Berlin process. But the rest uh, of the economies of the region have in nine months, we have monitored the figures, in nine months there are 13 million people who made use of the freedom of movement with ID cards. But still, this is a big concern because it speaks of the credibility of the agreements that I started to say, to say, to say earlier. It's the credibility. Once something is endorsed, once something is promised, once something is signed from the leaders, uh, then it's their utmost responsibility not to lie upon or, or, uh, or just, just to play upon, upon or after their, they, this moment of signature or the family photo in Berlin or, uh, or wherever it happens. I want to go back to Common Regional Market 2.0 that you said the final goal is to um, facilitate the entry into the single market, EU single market. But allow me to ask a question that for me and I think for other experts who maybe don't say it publicly, there is a little bit of ambiguity around uh, having national reforms in the six Western Balkan countries, having a reform agenda, and then a growth plan agenda, and then the EU single market. 
Can you please uh, help me understand how, uh, what is the organic connection among all these reforms and agendas that the region has as part of uh, accession to the EU? The EU has launched the growth plan for the Western Balkans. Recently, part, yeah. Part of the growth plan for the Western Balkans are the national reform agendas, meaning each of the Western Balkan economies had to propose to the European Commission a plan of what national agendas they would like to run and be part of this 6 billion euros of funding uh, that is that is the growth plan, the basket or the financement of the growth plan. Uh, and these are totally up to each economy uh, in the region. Then one of the strongest and the most important component of the growth plan is the common regional market. The idea behind is that you start from the national reform agendas, uh, proposing measures that in the near future will be part to the common regional market and then all together pave the way for the entry into the single market. Like, for example, I'll give you just only uh, uh, one example, like the digital uh, wallet. This is one of the initiatives that, uh, uh, and you know that the digital uh, component has been one of the main flagships, the most important one, I have to say, of the RCC. So the digital component has been brought through from our proposal, then working with, with uh, uh, every single economy in the region. And we propose the idea of the digital ID or the digital wallet, which means my data, your data, my diploma, my uh, car license, uh, and uh, whatever we have and share with each other can really be built up and compose one digital wallet. This is important locally. North Macedonia has already started testing it, how that would work. Then once the model is, is for every, every country, let's say, uh, possible, then they will work all together to have the digital wallet. So to share this data at the regional level. At the very end of the game is to share this data that all the six have already recognized and decided to share among each other with the EU. So this is the model how the process of the growth plan will work out. And the whole story that you might have heard quite frequently during these, these months from everybody from the European Commission or, or different representatives or special envoys in, uh, from, uh, on the Western Balkans is that no one will be able anymore to block somebody else. But you can only block yourself because that's how the reform agendas, the national reform agendas as well, come with some conditions. And one of the conditions as well is to deliver on the regional cooperation, on this common regional market component, and then all together to be ready for the entry into the single market. So I hope that I was clear on that one. Somehow, but I want to, to ask a follow-up question on the conditionality that you mentioned. How will this work? Like, uh, when should the funds be withheld or reinstated for a non-performing country, for instance? Are there clear steps that explain this? This is, this is a question for the European Commission. So on the conditionality, they are trying to identify and prepare their own, uh, their own way. So this is not something that has to do with the RCC. What we do here and what we can guarantee is that we bring the countries all together. So at the moment, then the European uh, single market will be, uh, let's say, or at the moment of the decision to assess and to access the single market, then we'll be ready and all the standards will be in place. Be those uh, aki related, so laws to be in place, or European standards. So that is, uh, let's say, the guarantee that we give from this perspective. But on the condition conditionality on the reform yeah. agendas, I think this is a plan. No, it's not that I think, but this is a plan that the European Commission is, uh, is still working on. I want to ask you about the future Berlin process. How do you see that and how could it be made more impactful? Uh, at the Berlin summit, I watched your, your uh, remarks and you quoted Jean Monnet saying that uh, we are uh, signing a coalition of people, not a coalition of states. What did you have in mind when you said that? I was just uh, quoting uh, Jean Monnet and he said that, uh, and you know, that he's one of the founders of the single market. Uh, 
And I guess that time, or at least as we know uh, from, from, from history, it was not that easy to convince the countries as well of, of today's European Union, uh, or like the ones who built it up or created the coal and steel community, to work close together, to forget the past, or uh, to walk past the, the war, uh, uh, let's say, misfortunes, but to build and work on building one market and one economy from which everybody could benefit. Uh, and I think it was sensitive those years, and it is quite sensitive for the Western Balkans today. We do have problems of recognition in the, in the Western Balkans. So we know that there is a dispute between Serbia and Kosovo. We know that Serbia does not recognize uh, Kosovo, and we know that yet Bosnia and Herzegovina does not recognize Kosovo. But this should not be an impediment for the economies to work together in trying to unify people to uh, like facilitate the trade, the mobility of services, the mobility of, uh, of citizens in the region. And that's the idea, uh, that was the idea of Jean Monnet back at that time, and I think that is the idea that should be, and nobody should be worried uh, uh, today, because this is not just to form a coalition of states or for anybody to be afraid, but it's unifying people and giving them the chance to benefit from, from the closer cooperation. And as I said, in these times, it shouldn't really be, and it's not wise and it's not smart, thinking that, uh, yes, uh, one can really run the show. Because the markets globally are quite difficult to be challenged. And for this region, it's quite difficult to attract foreign direct investments only uh, or being split in six small markets. It's always going to be a greater opportunity for the human capital and for the skilled people as well to find a job or be employed or to have an economic growth if we pull the resources all, all together. And on the Berlin process, I'm not passing the questions through your Balkan debrief to European Commission or to Berlin, but uh, uh, again, this is a decision that has to come as well from, from, uh, from uh, Berlin. I'm proud that RCC managed during these years to be the main coordinator of the Berlin process. Uh, we don't know yet uh, what's happening uh, next year, but uh, uh, I'm sure that the Berlin process will uh, will continue. But this is we not the been, most important. Yes. What is the, the most, most important? important thing? Be it on the growth plan, or be it on the on the Berlin process, is to foster a common vision and a clear purpose of cooperation and of our future in Europe. So this is going to be the most important, let's say, task, because both growth plan, uh, the European integration, the Berlin process trying to facilitate the, the cooperation are great opportunities. But the biggest challenge is going to be how to foster a common vision and a clear purpose of our future in Europe. I get your point, but I want to, we're running out of time and I want to have, uh, to have the opportunity to ask some uh, few questions uh, that I, I had in mind. First of all, there are two countries that are seeking EU membership aggressively. Montenegro is saying the 20th member by 2028 and Albania by 2030. Do you think this is um, possible? I'm not going to enter into the rhetoric of counting uh, and just checking uh, uh, the calendars. What I think it's possible is for the countries to be deeply uh, concerned and enough serious in meeting all uh, those reform requirements or uh, reform agendas that would really make uh, the process a bit easier. What I am concerned is uh, on how much of a burden it will be on the public administration and how much support they would need to get during these, these years of, of negotiations. Uh, and then what I am concerned or what I hope that is not going to happen, or if I would say it differently, what I hope that is going to happen is for EU to come up with clearer ideas that this is a political process that Western Balkans within the EU and within the TAN is always better and safer, both for the Western Balkans and for the EU. So I'm not going to enter in the rhetoric of, uh, of dates and numbers. I find it quite difficult uh, for the negotiations under the current rhythm 
to be finished, be it for Montenegro 2028 or for Albania 2030, uh, because it took 12 years to Montenegro from 2012 up to today to close, not yet fully, but still, let's say in there, let's consider it closed, four chapters. And there are 35 chapters in there. So as I said, the process has not to be a technical one, only by meeting and opening and closing chapters and clusters, but the political decision from the EU should be taken as it was taken in the case of Moldova, Ukraine, and Georgia. That would really speed up the process. And the other question, you and I both have uh, roots in the media, Melinda, a sector facing uh, distrust uh, as uh, 64% of the people say that uh, it serves political interest uh, with uh, rising fake news and disinformation. Is there any chance that the media can regain people's trust in the region? I'm afraid that we need to build and, uh, and create some mechanisms to identify the fake news from real news. Otherwise, uh, uh, we'll all be lost in, uh, in this, uh, let's say, we'll lose this world. In a world where fake news uh, and trash is running faster, it's going to be quite, and it's an army of people who work on that, it's going to be quite and even more difficult for, uh, let's say, the normal people to check, recheck, post and repost and then just try to to uh, to convince others that the fake news is fake news that is ruining everyone. There, there should be some guarantees in place. That's why the process started uh, even in, uh, in the big EU member states. So you know that in Germany there are fines now for all the misuse or the fake news or every the propaganda of the fake news, let's say, uh, and the army of fake news running via Facebook and so on. EU as well has its own uh, uh, plan on that regard. But in our, uh, in our countries and in this part of the world, still fake news is seen as a powerful, powerful tool in the hands of the manipulators. And, I'm and afraid I, I that think we can even well, say weapon at this point, not just yeah, tool. It's, uh, it, or it might be even more. It's a mutual self-destruction weapon that we have all uh, been uh, allowing to, to live and, uh, among uh, ourselves. And how do you assess Russia's and China's influence in the region? Does it pose any potential serious risk? Uh, we are seeing now the risks of the Russian propaganda influence in the region. And we know that Russia was not investing, uh, let's say, in financements, in, uh, in money, was more investing on the propaganda. And if we see a rise of fake news, that comes even because that strategy started years ago before any of us was really aware what was happening there. So by allowing it first, we made the story a bit more muddy. Then on China is, uh, is, a different, uh, is a different story. And I think that on China, one should stop while trying uh, to argue and check how the China presence in the region has been uh, during the last years or uh, why some of the countries from the region decided to run some of the biggest projects uh, via, let's say, the Chinese uh, or, or working with, uh, with Chinese investors. So these are uh, questions that uh, most probably will need some clear answers, but will even, even ask for a bit of more time that we can't elaborate now, because China is not, is not, a, small, it's not a small country. So since China is not something where the damage or the value of what comes with it is uh, it's small. And last question, because we're really running out of time. When you started your mandate, I was looking at your uh, speeches and interviews, you mentioned that your feelings uh, when you started as Secretary General for RCC were relief and doubt. Uh, now that you are preparing to, preparing to depart, what are your feelings? I wouldn't say relief now. I can still uh, say, uh, yes, some doubts are, are within me, still in there on uh, how the things have been moving or something that was not easily muttered uh, during all these years. Uh, but well, I have to say that then whenever one is approaching like a, a farewell or the end of a journey, I have to remind myself that uh, anyhow, it was challenging, but it was really worth doing. Did you feel supported by all the six uh, Western Balkan countries? I felt the support and uh, I felt the skepticism and I had moments of being, uh, let's say, not uh, not trusted. 
but even like attacked, I have to say. But in the end, resilience won, I think. At the end, resilience won and just consider and add up some, some different flavor in that regard. Just, I was the only Albanian and then plus or slash Albanian woman that led this, uh, these organizations since, uh, since its inception. So uh, I think that uh, the resilience was, was needed in, uh, in double this time. So it was more than, uh, more, uh, than, uh, than welcome. So any time that I found myself to be resilient on, uh, on my, during my mandate in here. But nevertheless, so it's, uh, I know what I'm going to miss and I know what I'm not going to miss from these six years of journey. Thank you very much for talking to Balkan Zibrief and for sharing with our viewers your cautious, sober optimism, I would say, about the region's European future. Thank you, too.